Okay. So, uh, last class we talked about basically how to calculate probability, right? And we, we mentioned that um, if there are a total of n ways, we can do a task. And, you know, we are interested in a particular outcome, then the probability of that particular outcome happening is 1 divided by n, right? And this is the reason we learned about all of the counting techniques, right? We didn't learn them just because, you know, they are good to know, which, which, that, which is the case. But we also learned them so that we can calculate n, right? The total number of ways we can do something, right? Um, <clears throat> so the first example that I gave you guys was this example from, you know, like uh, throwing two dice, right? So when we throw two dice, the total number of ways you know, that the outcome can happen is six times six, because the first, first die has six options, and the second die also has six options, right? So we, we are using the multiplication rule. We are saying the total number of ways is six times six. That's the total number of ways, right? So that's where this 36 is coming from, right? For counting four, we simply wrote down, you know, all possible ways that we can add up to nine, right? And there was a question last week. Uh, it's a good question that, you know, why, why did you assume that the two dice are different, right? And I don't think, I mean, I gave an answer. It was somehow, you know, uh, uh, it was not enough for myself, you know? So I thought about it more. So here I try to, you know, give you another, you know, justification for why I assume the two dice are different and why, you know, I'm counting, for example, look here, three and six. I'm counting it as one outcome, and six and three, I'm counting it as another outcome, right? So let's, let's see why that is, you know, why I'm assuming the two uh, dice are different, right? So here, let's, let's assume that the two, die, the two dice are both white, right? So exactly identical. I don't care which one is, you know, three, which one is six. All I care about is you have a three and six, right? So how many different ways can I have nine? So that was one of the mistakes that we made in the last class. We assumed one of the cases is one and eight, you know, which is not the case. When you throw a die, the maximum number you get is six, right? So basically, I can have um, three and six, which add up to nine. Four and five. Exactly, and four and five, yeah. Right? There's no other, you know, combination that gives me nine. Right? So there's only two options, right? So when I want to calculate the probability, the numerator is going to be two, right? Now let's, let's look at the other, you know, let's, let's try to count, you know, how many total ways I can do this, right? Here I have to count n, right? For the previous case, I assumed that the two uh, dice are different, and since I have two different dice, it's six times six, 36, right? So here, if I assume that they are the same, one of the options, let, let's try to count them. One of the options that can happen is one and one, right? So one and one gives me two, right? So here, I, I'll write the, basically the summation down here. So this gave me nine, this gives me two, right? So the summation can be two or it can be three. So I, I can have uh, the next option here is one and two. And here, one and two and two and one are the same. So I'm not going to repeat that, right? So this gives me three. And then here, uh, I need four, right? So for four, I can have either two and two, or I can have three and one, right? There's no other way, right? But if you think about you know, these numbers that I'm already writing, the solution is sort of starting to break down, right? Because remember, for the previous case, these n numbers should be equally likely. Remember the example, example I told you that there's either Mars, there's either life on Mars or there's no life on Mars. So there's two options, right? So probability of each one of them is one divided by two, right? Life in Mars or no life in Mars. And that's incorrect because these two outcomes are not equally likely, right? Or let's talk about moon, you know, which we know that most certainly doesn't have life, right? So these n outcomes have to be equally likely, right? When we move to this case, is one and one, you know? So let's look at, focus on, on this case. 
And for example, let's focus on this case. Are these two equally likely? Like when you throw two dice, is one and one as likely as four and five? No, no they are not. One and one is less likely than four and five. Because when you are getting four and five, you know, there's a chance that one of them is four, the other one is five, and you know, vice versa. But when you're getting one and one, both of them must be one, right? So it's sort of like, you know, like look at uh, families with two children, right? Probability of having a boy and a girl is higher than probability of having two girls, right? Because when you have two girls, both of the chi children must be girls, right? But when you have a boy and a girl, either the older one can be a girl or the younger one, right? So, um, so in fact, that's a good example, right? So like boy and girl, right? So boy and girl, right? The probability of a family with two children having a boy and girl is two divided by four, right? Because either the younger one is a girl or, a, or the older one, right? And probability of two girls is one divided by four and probability of two boys is also one divided by four, right? So coming back to basically our previous discussion, you know, these two cases that I have boxed, they are not equally likely. And because of this, we can't simply add them when I want to, you know, calculate this n, right? But the solution in the next page where I have assumed they are different, all of these are equally likely. You know, one and one here is as likely as, you know, this one and three here. You know, each one of them is counted one time, and that's correct. Any questions? All right. And just coming back here, you know, we can, this is a good practice, you know, always when you finish, try to double check. So here we can check one of the axioms of probability, right? The summation of these three numbers is one, right? So two divided by four plus one divided by four plus one divided by four is one. And basically that's, when you have two kids, you know, so let, let's, let's, not take it, let's not talk about, you know, asexual. I know that that's not the case, but assuming that every kid is either a boy or a girl, which I know is an incorrect assumption, if we assume that, these should add up to one. Right? Any questions? Yeah, are you? Yeah. Yeah, so, so maybe, uh, so when I wrote boy and girl, it wasn't ordered, right? So when I wrote boy and girl, so we have two kids, right? We can write the outcome for each one of them, right? So the first one can be boy. The second one can be a girl. The first one can be a boy. And then the second one can be a boy also. So, so the first one can be a boy, and then the second one also a boy. So this is, let's say, the older one, right? So this is the older one. And then we can have a girl and a boy, or a girl and a girl, right? So I agree that these are the four, we agree that these are the four options we can have, right? This is our sample space, right? So probability of having a boy and a girl, those are the outcomes that concern us, boy and a girl, girl and a boy. Right? <clears throat> Other questions? Yep. For if I really understand the difference between that and the other example, it's counted one time. I don't see why it's counted only one time. Because I see it's like the same idea here and there, like one, one here. It's not uh, the same as, like, the sum, summation to get two, it's not the same probability as getting nine. And the other example is pretty similar, you know? Yeah, they are similar, right? To get nine, you have four options, but to get one, you have only, to get two, you have two options. Yeah, so about the boy and girl example, right? Yeah. So the basically, uh, this one is easier to, you know, the reason I, I, this one came to my mind is that 
here with two dice, you know, it's every die has six options, right? With, with two and gear is binary, right? So that's, it, it's an easier, you know, option. That's why I, I, I gave this example. But here, right, um, this would be, you know, so like this, uh, this analysis here, sort of would be similar to the discussion about two dice. If I assume that oh, order of the kids doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if the older one is a boy or a younger one is a boy, right? All I care is a boy and a girl, right? So is it as if you say if we had only one dice, each number has one over six possibilities? And what's the question? If I have... That the probability is 1 over 6 for all, so it's equal? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. If I have one die, there are six options, and probability of each number is the same. It's 1 divided by 6. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But in the, other, in the other example, they are not equal, all of them. It's not 1 over 36 for, for each. So how we were able to... Yeah, they are 1. Yeah, that's a good question. So here... Uh, you know, if we if we count these numbers, they are there are a total of thirty six. Uh, there are a total of thirty six number of possibilities here, right? It's uh, it's one here, two, three, and so forth, right? If we count them, they are thirty six, right? They are equally likely. So in the other example, we can just calculate the outcomes and divide it by, divide two by the number of outcomes. No, we can't do that because these two, right? Yes, that's correct. These are two outcomes. But four and five, for an example, is not as likely as one and one, right? Four and five, in fact, is twice as likely as one and one. And because of that, you know, this, this example of one divided by n, or let's say instead of, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, possibility of each outcome, let's say possibility of two certain outcomes that we are interested in, right? Then 2 divided by n, which is our case here, this only holds if these n are equally likely. Otherwise, this will not hold. This is incorrect. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so basically, like another wrong solution here I can give is that, oh, you're talking about two kids. So the possible outcomes are following. You can either have a boy and a girl, or you can have two girls, or you can have two boys, right? So probability of each one of them is 1 divided by 3. That's incorrect, right? Probability of having two boys is 1 divided by 3. Probability of having two girls is 1 divided by 3. And a boy and a girl is also 1 divided by 3. That's, that's, that's incorrect. Yeah. And, and sorry, and you can sort of like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how many parents of, you know, like children, you know, but if you look around, you sort of see that, that there are more families with a boy and a girl as opposed to two girls, right? Or two boys, right? And that's because the other one is twice as likely. Yeah. Sorry here, aren't you, uh, both, both are correct, but the problem would be the condition. Because you're talking about age and uh, gender over there. Age? Yeah, so if you introduce the condition for the point, so if you say, the only condition would be the gender. It will be only three options. But if you introduce the gender and the age, it's going to be four. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly the, the all, the all. So the, it's a good question. So the question is you are adding age. You care about which one is the older one, right? I don't care about age, right? In fact, we gave all of this argument for saying that when you count, you have to look at, you know, when you count the total ways, you, you can't simply, you know, bag boy and girl and girl and girl in the, into the same category. Because a boy and a girl, I know that you don't care about age, but a boy and a girl is twice as likely as a boy and a boy because you can have, you know, okay, I can give you like one very simple answer why boy and a girl is more likely. Because assume that you are looking at a family and you only look at one of their childs, right? Like the bigger one, right? And assume that the bigger one is a boy then this basically is completely out of the question. They can't have two girls because the older one is, is a boy, right? There's no way they have a boy and a girl because the older, uh, there's, no, there's no way they have two girls because the older one is a boy, right? But they can still have a boy and a girl, right? So do you, do you see now why boy and girl is more likely than two girls? I see, but uh, what controls the, the result to be the conditions that we have? No, there's no condition here. There's no, uh, so basically, uh, 
This, this should be intuitive. There's no proof for this. I, I cannot prove that a boy and a girl is more likely than two girls, right? This, this is the only intuition I can give you that, let's say that you look at the older child, right? And the older child is a boy. Then there's no way this family has two girls, right? But if the older child is a boy, there's a still a chance that they have a boy and a girl, if the younger one is a girl, right? So this is the only justification. I can't prove that this is more likely than this. Other questions? Yeah, so in, in probability, unfortunately, that's the case. Many things are going to sound, you know, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if we have time. Like at the end of the term, I often talk about few examples where are controversial, right? So your question is an excellent question. And those controversial questions come up with, you know, articles in, you know, USA Today and Scientific America. You know, first this famous mathematician says this probability is this. And then another famous mathematician says, no, you're wrong, this probability is this, right? So, I mean, if you, if you struggle to agree with what I say, you know, uh, I sympathize with you because many concepts in probability, uh, one of the cases that we, I usually talk about is a problem called Monty Hall problem. You can look it up, but I will talk about it, you know, at the end of the term. Um, it's a famous case, it's a game show, right? And there were articles published, you know, in, I don't remember, either USA Today or Scientific America by well-known mathematicians. Each one, you know, saying, oh, you're wrong. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. So why are we using, like, a boy and girl example? Like, I mean, like, without, when we don't care about the order, like, boy and girl is exactly girl and boy. When I'm trying to use the combination formula, it's not giving me, like, yeah, so here we are not using any counting formula, right? When you have only, so perhaps, you know, like a, a, even a better example than a boy and a girl would be two digit numbers, right? So I assume that I have a binary number, it's two digits, right? So I think that's a much better example, right? I have a binary number, it has two digits. How many two digit binary numbers do I have? Zero, 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 one. Sorry. One zero and one one, right? I have four options, right? So here I can say probability of two zeros, probability of two ones, and probability of a zero and a one, right? So here I think is much more clear. Right? So probability of two zeros is not one divided by three, it's one divided by four, because there's four options. Yeah, but we shouldn't get the four from the rule of combination? No, four comes from multiplication rule. I have two digits to fill up. Each one has two options, so two times two. Right? I have two digits. Each one has two options. It's two times two. Other questions? All right, so that's a, that's a very good discussion. All right, so let's move on. Uh, we talked about axioms of probability. We talked about probability of a union. So this was the example that we ended the last class. So a wafer is randomly selected from a batch that's classified by contamination and location, right? So I have basically two classifications. One of them is called contamination. The other one is called location. And H is the event of high concentration, right? High con concentration of contamination. So, for example, uh, the probability of H, right? Let's change the color. So probability of H, probability of high concentration of contamination, I have to look at this row, right? So all of my basically wafers that have high contamination are 358. So probability of H is going to be 358 divided by 940. Right. So again, note that I didn't count this or I didn't count this. I looked at the total number, right? Because the question just told me high contamination. It didn't care whether it's at the center or at the tool, right? Uh, or at the edge, sorry. Okay. 
So this is the one we just wrote down here. And the rest of them are also quite similar. Probability of contamination is going to be uh, uh, at the, sorry, C is the center, right? So center is going to be this guy. Basically this row, this column gives me center, right? And probability of H intersection C. So here I care about both high contamination and center. So that's going to be 112, right? That's the intersection. Again, divided by 940. I always divide by the total number. Right. <clears throat> and now we can use, you know, this equation, right? So this is one of the equations that's also provided in the crib sheet, right? Probability of H union C is probability of H plus C minus H intersection C, right? So these are all of the probabilities we already calculated, right? So one, two, three. These numbers come from up there. Uh, and that's the answer. And basically, this equation is the addition rule that's provided in the crib sheet. Any questions? All right. So if you have more than, um, if you have more than two sets, then the addition rule is going to be more interesting. So it's going to be P of A plus P of B plus P of C minus P intersection A and B minus P intersection A and C minus P intersection B and C. And at the end, we have to add, sorry, um, we have to add intersection of all three of them. So it's, it's alternating the signs. Any questions about this equation up here? Yeah? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so for the, you know, so let's first talk about, you know, the previous case. So if I have only two sets, right, A and B, then the probability of A union B is probability of A plus probability of B. But what's going to happen is that I'm going to count this guy twice. So I have to subtract it once to account for that, right? Now with, with three sets, what's going to happen is that, um, so let's say I have three sets, right? A, B, and C. So <clears throat> I'm going to subtract this guy because it's A intersection B, right? I'm going to subtract this guy because it's B intersection C, and I'm going to subtract this guy because it's A intersection C. And the problem is that the region in the middle gets subtracted too many times, right? So I have to add one more time, yeah. And you know, thankfully, this equation is quite easy. You know, so you don't even need it in the crib sheet because the signs are simply alternating. It's plus, then minus, then plus, then minus, then plus. So even like we can write the equation for. We are not going to do that, but we can write the equation for a union b union c union d. It's the exact same. You know, trend. The sign alternate. Other questions? All right. So now if a collection of events are pairwise mutually exclusive, right? So that means that um, event one, event I intersection event J is an empty set for all I and J, then the union is going to be simply the sum of the probabilities, right? So this is an equation that, you know, like we have in our mind and we often use, we say, oh, probability of, you know, this event union, this event is probability of, you know, this plus that. But remember that this is often wrong, right? This, this uh, equation is often wrong because the sets are not mutually exclusive, right? So this equation is only collect, co correct if this condition is met. Otherwise, this correct, uh, equation is incorrect. And, you know, I've seen many, many times that this equation is used in the exam, you know, in the... You know, in the project, they are all incorrect. Yeah. yeah just to make sure, so for the example of A united B united C united D, so we have like a complete combination of like three, like and the probability of the uh, intersection of C three, and then add one term to the intersection of four. Sorry, what's the question? I mean, like for the four. 
Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's faster if I write it because it's, it's, quick, it's difficult to just say. Uh, so basically for, for four sets, it's going to be probability of A union B union C union D is going to be probability of A plus dot, 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 plus probability of D, right? So at first we add all of them, right? Then we subtract each pair of them, right? P A intersection B minus P A intersection C dot, 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 minus P C intersection D, right? And then we are going to add three of them plus P of A intersection B intersection C plus B of A intersection B intersection D plus dot, dot, dot. And then at the end, minus the exactly, minus P of A intersection B intersection C intersection D. Other questions? <coughs> okay. So uh, the next concept that's also quite difficult to grasp is conditional probability. Right? I, I keep saying this, and I, I really hope that you guys practice. But if you don't, you know, this course is going to sound very strange to you very soon. Right? And one of those concepts is conditional probability. Right? So make sure, you know, after every lecture, you know, you, uh, you, you basically do the, uh, you know, the suggested problems. So P of B given A is the probability of event B happening, assuming that event A has already happened, right? So this is really a key assumption here. We assume that A has already happened. Right? So that's what P of B given A means. Right? So whenever you get confused, when you see P of B given A, the first thing you have to say to yourself is, oh, A has already happened. Right? So let's look at an example. A communication ca channel has an error, an error rate of one per 1,000 bits transmitted, which means that errors are rare but do not tend to occur in bursts. If a bit is in error, then probability that the next bit is also in error is greater than one divided by 1,000, right? So basically this question says that, you know, if, if you have one bit that's error, most likely the next bit is not an error because errors don't happen, you know, in like in uh, neighboring, um, neighboring bits. And the equation for conditional probability is as follows. Right? So P of B given A is P of E intersection B divided by P of A. And of course, P of A can't be zero, right? If P of A is zero, then this is nonsense. This is not even defined, right? Because when we say P of B given A, we assume A, a has already happened, right? So A can't be an impossible outcome. So if we look at it from a frequency perspective of n equally likely outcomes, which is like many cases in, you know, uh, in, that in life that we encounter are like that, P of A is the number of outcomes in A divided by n. P of A intersection B is number of outcomes in A, divided, A intersection B divided by n. And P of B given, given A is Number of, prob number of outcomes in A intersection B divided by number of outcomes in A, right? So here what's important is that here the denominator is the number of outcomes in A, right? Not in, uh, not in N anymore, right? So note that P of A, for example, we divide by N, but once it becomes conditional probability, we don't divide by N anymore. We divide by, you know, the number of outcomes uh, in A, for example, when we say P of B given A. Right, so it's, uh, you know, don't worry if you have questions, we'll do many examples. And I think I mentioned in the messages that these, you know, the new... Uh, way that I record, 
the video has become huge. You know, like last week, the video was 700 megabytes, and the Moodle limit is 250 megabytes. So I'm not going to upload them on Moodle anymore. In fact, there's no way to do that. And there's no easy way to do that. OK, so let's, let's basically continue with this running example that we have and calculate the conditional probability, right? So again, we have the same example as before, right? So the total number of particles that we have is 400. <clears throat> now, probability of having a, a flat particle is going to be uh, a particle with a flaw is going to be um, surface flaw. So we look at here, flaw, the total number is 40, right? So probability of flaw is 40 divided by 400, and probability of defective is 28 divided by 400, right? Now I want to calculate probability of uh, defective given flaw, right? So from the equation, that's intersection divided by P of F. So I already calculated P of F. That was 4 divided by 400. Probability of uh, D intersection F. So I have to look at D intersection F. That's 10, right? So maybe we can write that here. Probability of D intersection F is the number that are both defective and have a flaw, so 10, divided by n, 400. Right? And the rest is just arithmetic. This 400 and this 400 calculate, so that's 1 divided by 4. Right? So here, I use the equation of conditional probability. There is another way that I find easier to calculate this, and I think you guys have also thought about it already, right? Why don't we do it that way? So the other way is I say P of D given F, right? So didn't we say that when I say given, it means that F already happened? Yeah, we said F already happened, right? So how many total ways are there for F to happen? 40, right? So when, when we say F, when we say given F, it means that I'm definitely in this column, right? So my sample space is not 400 anymore, it's 40, right? And what's the probability of defective? 10. So that's also 1 divided by 4, right? So I find this one easier than the previous one. So here in the second solution, I didn't use the equation of conditional probability. I just used my intuition. Questions? So one way, one very good way to calculate these conditional probabilities is by uh, looking at, you know, this tree diagram, right? So um, here what we can do is uh, I can basically write this on the board so that you can see these numbers so that you can, you can associate it with this table, right? So the numbers that I have are either defective or non-defective. And here I have flaw or no service flaw, right? So this table has a total of four numbers that are interesting. So 10, 18, 30, and 342, right? The rest of them are just summation of these, right? So for example, like, uh, I add 10 and 30, that's going to be 40. I add 18 and 3, 42, that's going to be 360, I guess, right? Or I add 10 and 18, that's going to be 28. Or I add 30 and 3, 42, that's going to be 370. So let's look at this tree. So here, um, we either have a surface flaw or we don't have a surface flaw, right? The chance of having a surface flaw is 40. 
divided by 400. Because here, for me to have a flaw, it can either be defective or non-defective. So 40 divided by 360, right? Now, the second, uh, the second branch is where it gets interesting, right? So this is, this point, it means that I already have a surface flaw, right? So now my sample space has changed to 40. Look here, the probabilities are, the, basically the number in the denominator is not 400 anymore, it's 40, right? So that means that these guys are conditional probabilities. So here is a probability of, so this yes is the probability of, uh, what was the other one? De defective. defective, right? So defective given flaw. Right? So this node, it means that it's already flawed. Uh, it has a flaw, sorry. And this node, it means that, uh, yeah, this one, it means that it doesn't have a surface flaw. Right? So, so just remember that the numbers that you see, you know, at the lower branches of this tree, you know, this can continue, right? These are all conditional probabilities. This means that the previous event has already happened. So here, for example, I do condition on F. And that's why this number is 40, right? And here I condition on, you know, not a flaw, 360. So that's why the number is 360. Any questions? Okay. So, So let's look at this, you know, uh, when, we, uh, when, we, when we want to like, uh, when we want to use this for multiplying, you know, probabilities. So let's consider this example that we have a bag. This bag has five blue marbles and six red marbles, right? So five blue, six red. We pick, uh, we pick four items without replacements, right? So we pick four items. What's the probability of the first item being blue? So that's going to be uh, 5 divided by 11, right? Because I have a total of 11 marbles, the probability of the first marble that I remove is blue is 5 divided by 11, right? Now, the second question is, what's the probability of second item being blue and the first item being blue, right? So it's, not, it's, it's an and, it's not conditioned, right? So here, here is what, you know, we use the conditional probability, but in the other way, right? So we say that, let me, um, let me calculate something else instead. Let me calculate probability of, so this is a bit difficult to compute. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do the following. Probability of second item, second blue, given that the first item was blue, right? So instead of this and, I'm going to compute something else. I'm going to compute the conditional probability, right? You're going to, so if you're confused why I'm, going, I'm doing this, you're going to find out very soon. So I changed the problem into an easier one, right? So this is going to be, so I'm assuming that the first one was already blue, right? So it means that now my, my sack has, um, four blue and six red, right? So, so here, conditioned on first blue, which that means that I have already removed one blue. So this basically sack has changed. It's four blue and six red. So this probability is going to be what? Exactly, four out of 10. Right? And now I'm going to use the conditional probability rule, but in the other way around. So I'm going to say, remember, P of, P of A given B is P of A intersection B divided by P of B, right? So that means that P of A intersection B is equal to P of, um, a given B 
times probability of B, right? This is the same equation, right? And this is a very useful equation. You're going to use it very often, right? So, so I'm going to say probability of um, second item blue and first blue is going to be equal to probability of um, second blue given first is blue divided by probability of first is blue. Right? Oh, yeah, multiply. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I was looking for where's the multiplication. Thank you. Yeah, there's no space. I don't know what to do. Um, um, yeah, so I, I, I write a bit uh, smaller. So this is going to be P of P of uh, second blue given first blue times probability of first blue. So let me just put a box around this thing. Right. So probability of second blue and first blue is equal to probability of second blue given first blue times probability of first blue. Right. And I have calculated both of these up here. So that is going to be equal to 5 divided by 11 times four divided by 10. So that's the answer, right? So the answer to the second line that I didn't answer is going to be five divided by 11 times four divided by 10. Any questions? Okay. So let's look at one example that usually, you know, our intuition is wrong. Usually our intuition is wrong with many probability questions, right? So last time I checked on Friday, there were 108 students registered in this class. <clears throat> so the question is, what's the probability that no two people share the exact same birthday, right? For example, no two people in this class have, you know, for example, I don't know, January 15th as a birthday, right? So what's the probability that all of you guys have a unique birthday? Or in other words, um, let's say we are playing a gambling game, right? I say that I bet, you know, 10 bucks, right? That if we start from here, and everybody, you know, says their birthday, by the time we reach the last person, for sure two birthdays are going to be exactly the same, right? So how many people bet me? If I say I bet you 10 bucks that if we start from here and everybody says their birth name, uh, birthday, you know, there's going to be at least two people that, you know, share the same birthday. So raise your hand if you would, you know, accept my bet. And raise your hand if you don't accept my bet. OK. So another question. So assume instead of 108, there were, I don't know, 50 people in the class. So OK, one question. If there was 366 students in the class, for sure two people would share the same birthday, right? Because there's more people than the number of days in a year, right? But you know, now assume that instead of 108, there were, this was a smaller class. Right? And in fact, I'm sure that not 108 people are here. I think here there's probably like 70 people, right? So 
would you still accept my bet with 70 people in this class? So raise your hand if you accept my bet with 70 people. Raise my hand if you, uh, raise your hand. <laughs> you can't raise my hand. Raise your hand if you, uh, if you don't accept my bet. Okay, so what if I tell you the following? Uh, let's say that there are 70 people in the class, right? I pay you a thousand bucks, right? So the question is, instead of 108, there were 70 people in the class, oh sorry. Let's say there were 70 people in this class, right? If I lose, I pay you a thousand bucks, right? But if I win, meaning that at least two people had the same birthday, you give me five bucks, right? Maybe I should, I don't know if it's legal or not. <laughs> Maybe I should play that game. So how many of you would accept that bet? Raise your hand if you would accept my bet that if I pay you a thousand bucks, you know, uh, if I lose. And how many of you wouldn't accept my bet? Okay, all right. Um, so let, let's calculate the probability, right? I think, uh, I don't remember the probability off the top of my head, but even if I pay you a million dollars, you know, based on math, you shouldn't, accept the, uh, you shouldn't accept the bet, because even with 70 people, for sure two people are going, almost for sure two people are going to share the birthday, right? So let's calculate that probability, right? So basically, this is how I'm going to solve this. I'm going to say um, I have 365 days, day one, day two, all the way to day 365, right? This is correct, right? Not the, like the 28 numbers, right? Can, you, can somebody confirm 365 days? Okay. All right. So here's basically, so I'm going to, I'm going to calculate the probability of Probability of me losing, right? So probability of prof losing, right? That means that no people, no two people share a birthday, right? So that's going to be, so the first person can be born on any day, right? So the first person, you know, has, uh, has with the probability of one, the first, per the first person doesn't share the birthday with anybody, right? Now the second person, one day is already gone, right, out of 365. So there's 364 days left. And the, sorry, 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 made a mistake. So, so the next person can be born in any 364 days that's left out of the 365, right? The second person cannot be born in the same day as the first person. Right? And then the third person will going to have 363 days left. I'm basically using the same thing, you know, like the product of my probabilities, right? So 363 and dot, 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 and then 365. Now for the 70th person, 69 people, 69 days have already been occupied, right? Because 69 day people have been assigned. So it's going to be 365 minus 69. Right? And uh, yeah, this, this number, for example, is like, uh, let's just write it. So it's, so I won't write not one because it's just one. So 364. times 363 times dot, 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 times. So the last number is going to be 296, I guess. Yeah, yeah 96. To the power, uh, not 69. So basically here we start from, here is, uh, no, no, I think it's 70. Yeah, 70. Yeah, because there are 70 terms. Uh, counting one, there are, uh, no, actually. I don't know divided by what? 69, yes, uh, sorry. So let's count. So here we are starting, so here, yeah, I think it's 69. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's unfortunately this is a bit long to punch in a calculator, right? So uh, when I when I use the my my laptop, I, I have a code that you know it's it's a very simple code. You can calculate this, right? It's just a for loop, a simple for loop. You calculate this, right? Um, for the next class, I will calculate this, but you know I promise you the number is going to be like point zero 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 many zeros, you know, and then you know some number is going to appear. So this is a very small number, right? Meaning that even if I offer a million dollars, you know. Uh, chances are I'm going to, you know, win some money at the end. Right? So if I actually do want to play this game, I won't offer a million dollars because, you know, uh, I will go bankrupt if I pay a million. But I can, you know, just for the fun, I can play with, you know, a hundred bucks. Right? And I'm sure I will, you know, uh, win a lot of money. So basically, uh, our intuition, you know, when we deal with, you know, many numbers that are multiplied. So here there are, you know, 69 numbers that are multiplied. Our intuition is often wrong, you know, when many numbers are multiplied, right? So I, I can give you one famous example. A few years ago, Warren Buffett had a challenge, right? He said that he basically proposed a game, right? He said that if you can predict completely the NCAA bracket, meaning that there is a total of uh, 63 games, right? I'm not a sports fan, so, but I think it has 63 games. If you can completely predict the outcome of all 63 games correctly before the games start, I give you a billion dollars, right? So Warren Buffett does have a billion dollars to give, right? Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that this was, like, uh, this was free, right? Uh, you didn't need to you know, pay to play, right? It was free to play. But still it was, you know, he, he has, you know, of course he has good mathematicians, you know, working work for him. So they had already calculated that the probability of, you know, estimating 63 games correctly is if, if you do by chance, right? Of course, you know, you can make educated guesses, say, oh, this team is better than the other team and so forth. But if you just do by chance, the number is 9e minus 18, right? So that means that, for example, if... Uh, 10, uh, 100 million people participate, so 100 million, so 100 times 10 to the 6. So even if this many people participate, this, this times this is going to be, uh, so the, uh, like the, the probability of at least one of them winning is going to be this, this number, multiplied by the probability, right? Uh, or, yeah, divided by that number. Divided by 2 to the power 63, right? And still, it's a very small number, right? It's, uh, this is only 10 to the power 8. And here we have 10 to the power 18, right? So it's going to be almost 1 divided by 10 to the power 8, right? So 1 divided by 10 to the power 8 is like a, you know, a very, very small number, right? almost 0. And that's if, all, like, that's if you know, 100 million people play this game, which is not going to be the case. Many people don't have uh, internet access. Yeah? Yeah, in the previous example, what we calculated is the probability that two share the same birthday or that not two share the same birthday. Yeah, so the, the probability I calculated is probability of prof losing. So that means that no two people share the birthday. So in this class, all, all birthdays are unique. And so small? Yeah. Yeah, it is very small. So for sure, so for sure in this class, like in this class right now, two people have exactly the same birthday. So if you want, we can, you know, it's going to take some time, but we can find, you know, I'm sure like even in this, you know, in this half, if we start from here, we are going to find two people who have the same birthday. Yeah, it is counterintuitive, but yeah, that is the case. I mean, but because like 70 is less than 365, so how it's like... Yeah, exactly. So 70 is a lot less than 365, right? So that makes like, we, we don't have like... Have yeah, so there are, you're right, there are ways that 70 people can have unique birthdays, but by chance, two people will have the same birthday. But this chance is too small, right? This chance is very big. For certain. 
the probability I calculated was probability of prof losing, which means that at least two people share a birthday. Yeah, so no, no. So uh, probability of me losing is zero, right? So what was this? Let's write it down. So that was equal to probability of no to... Oh, yeah, I made a mistake. No two people. Yeah, you are right. I made a mistake. Share birthday. So this means that actually this was probability of prof winning, right? No, yeah, prof losing. That's correct. Yeah. So no two people shared the birthday. Yeah. No, I didn't make a mistake. In the class, we cannot find two have the same birthday, right? You are you are leading me to confusion. Say it again. I mean, I mean, like if we have seventy-one students and we have three hundred sixty-five days. So for sure, two people. Let, let me say it. For sure, two people share a birthday. Why? For sure, if you have. Like, I just calculated it. That this is why. Okay, but we have numbers. Yeah, it's less than 365. I know it's less. You can, you, you can say, oh, 30 people born in January, right? 30 people, 28 people born in February. You, you will run out of people, right? But that's if you, you know, that's not random anymore, right? If you assign birthdays randomly, two people will share a birthday. I know that there are ways no two people share a birthday. And I agree with you that your intuition says that, oh, there are many ways that 70 people don't share the same birthday because 70 is much less than 365. But we just calculated the probability. It's zero, right? It's almost zero. That's as, as close as zero as you can get, right? But isn't this idea like that we have calculated is that we are removing one day, right? And we're calculating like 364 or 365. So that means there are two different birthdays, not the same, right? Yeah, so the probability of different birthdays is zero. Different. Not two different, all different birthdays. We don't want just two people to have this different birthdays. We want, you know, so two people, you know, sec second person not have the same birthday, and then the third person not, that, not have the same birthday as the first two, fourth person not that ha have the same birthday as the first three, and so forth. Yeah, we can discuss later. Yeah, we can discuss about this for, you know, let's not take classes time more. Should we calculate uh, the probability of two people actually having two birthdays? What do you want to find? Yeah, so the question is, you know, what is the probability of uh, Basically, you win it. probability of what? You win it. Yeah, so probability of my winning is going to be 1 minus this. So, right, so probability of prof winning is 1 minus that point zero 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 something, so that's 1. Okay. All right. So uh, let, let's look at the case where, you know, I can break my sample set. So this is my sample set, right? I can break it into two mutually exclusive events. For example, A and A prime of, are, of course, always mutually exclusive, right? Then if I want to calculate probability of B, so B is this set, right? Does somebody actually have a, you know, can quickly quote this? I'm, I'm curious to know the number. You know, I know this is 0. 0.00 something. But uh, if somebody, you know, so, yeah, did, did you already calculate it? How many, how many zeros do I have here? Yeah, so I think Google didn't write the following uh, nines. I'm sure there is more than, uh, uh, you know, just 99.9. .9. There must be more nines. Yeah, I hope I'm, I'm not wrong. Uh, I think my intuition, like my memory, tells me that with 70, we are going to get a very small number. I think it's going to be uh, easy. It's going to be 365. Yeah, but there are many things that you need to multiply. That's the issue. No, 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 no. <coughs> no, that's not a. You have to multiply all of these numbers. Why, why do you multiply only two? Yeah, that's a different question. No, this is not the same. Yeah. Um, I think there was a talk about this very specific case, and I think it's about 26 students that you need for an absolute certainty. 
How many? 26 people. Why? Why? I mean, they did the math. I can't remember off the top of my head. But I see. OK. Yeah. So absolute certainty, you need 366, right? So you know you need more people than the number of days, right? So what do you mean by absolute certainty? Maybe not absolute, but yeah, very large number, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. With 70, we are going to get a number, you know, very close to zero. <coughs> so yeah, even with like 30 students, which is very counterintuitive. If you have 30 people, two of them are going to share a birthday. All right. So let's move on. <coughs> so. This is a very nice way to calculate uh, probability of B, right? So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to say that probability of B is going to be this probability, probability of B intersection A <coughs> plus probability of B intersection A prime. Right? So I'm going to say probability of B is this part plus this part. Right? <coughs> and then uh, from the previous slide, from definition of conditional probability, probability of B intersection A is B given A is B given A times A, and probability of B intersection A prime is B given A prime times P of A prime. Right? So this is, in fact, a very, very important equation, right? And we will use it a lot, you know, not just for the course, you know, in your life, you know, when you break down problems, you often say, oh, e, you, I either have, you know, A happen or A prime, then I add the probabilities, right? So let's look at the first case. <coughs> um, we have basically this table, right? So. Uh, for for a high you know for a high level of uh, contamination my probability of failure is 0.1 and for you know not high like low level of contamination my le probability of failure is 0 0.005 right <clears throat> so this does make sense right let's say you have manufactured the product if your contamination is high, there's a 10% chance that the product fails. If your level of contamination is low, then there is, you know, uh, this is 0.5%, right? <coughs> there's a 0.5% that my uh, contamination, that uh, I don't fail, right? The question is asking, what's the probability of failure, right? I don't care about you know, don't ask me, do I have high contamination? Do I have low contamination? In general, tell me what's the probability of failure, right? This is the question, right? So basically, uh, we are going to answer it exactly like the previous slide. So <coughs> I'm going to say that I either have high contamination or I don't have a high contamination. So uh, <clears throat> don't be freaked out if I cough. I'm, I'm just like that. When I shout for you know, an hour, I start coughing. In fact, I have another class you know, later. And in that class, I cough. You know, I feel bad for those guys because I coughed sort of the entire class. right? So, uh, so either I have contamination or I don't have a contamination. right? I can't have a product that both has a contamination and doesn't have a contamination. right? And then I'm looking for the probability of failure, right? <clears throat> so I can have a failure if I have high contamination, or I can have failure if I have low contamination, right? So the first thing I'm going to calculate is probability of failure given high contamination, right? So failure given high is already given by the problem. That's 0.1. Failure given not high is 0.005. <clears throat> And then remember from this equation, I need P of B given A times P of A, right? So here I need to calculate probability of, uh, I need to basically, uh, uh, 
what do I need to do actually? So let's let's write down the equation. So P of F P of F P of failure is going to be P of failure given high plus P of failure given not high, right? And that's going to be P of failure <coughs> intersection high times P of high, right? Plus the second term. So I'm not going to write the second term. It's quite similar to the first term. So basically for this, now I have to calculate, you know, so P of uh, F given H, sorry, P of F and H. <coughs> uh, Sir, I think you like, run the equation because uh, P of F is the intersection and then we use the... Sorry, yes, you're right. Thank you. I should give you a chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> you are right. Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah. This is wrong, right? Thank you very much. This is incorrect, right? So basically, uh, P of F is not P of F given H plus P of F given H prime. P of F is equal to P of F intersection H plus P of F intersection H prime, right? Yeah, look here. This is this probability plus this probability. And these are intersection, not conditional probabilities. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> so now P of F given H is going to be, F and H is going to be P of F given H times probability of uh, H, right? So here uh, P of F given H is 0.1. P of H is uh, 0.2, and then <clears throat> the product of these two is going to be 0.02. So this guy here is 0.02, and the next guy is going to be 0.004, right? So when we look at this you know, Venn diagram, it does make sense because, again, if we plot the Venn diagram with the same color, so... So probability of high contamination is only 2%. So probability of high contamination is low. So let, let's plot it to a scale. Try to plot it to a scale. So this is H at the corner, and the other one is H prime, right? <coughs> so H prime, H prime is much more common, you know? Most of the time, 80% of the time, we don't have high contamination, right? And now, if I don't have a contamination, my probability of failure is quite low. So So <clears throat> this part of the failure, right, is only 0.004. And this other type of part of the failure is 0.02, right? So as you can see, most failures happen if I have a contamination. <clears throat> so the total probability of failure is going to be, as you see in this slide, <clears throat> is going to be a P of F intersection H plus P of F intersection H prime, and that's this number. <clears throat> and we can extend it to more than two, right? We can have uh, many, uh, many events. So P of B is going to be P of B intersection E1 plus P of B intersection E2 plus dot, 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 which is going to be equal to P of B given E1 times P of E1 plus P of B given E2 times P of E2 plus dot, 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 and this is the last one, right? So basically, I say probability of some events B is going to be this, union this, union this, and union this. <clears throat>